I think I'd been labelled with a sort of um, a baddie kind of image quite early on. And when they brought Clive Foster in, he was a lawyer who, who made strong attempts to, to scupper the, uh, uh, the timber business, which I think was at the back of the, uh, the whole series. And um, at that stage, I quite enjoyed playing the baddie. Um, latterly, I became a little tired of it, especially when we got up to Shortland Street and they were still casting me as a baddie. Um, uh, yeah, I enjoyed playing Clive Foster. I wasn't, I suppose, in it terribly long, and that could be because, as you say, it was the New Zealand voice, and at that stage I was still rather much an English voice. So uh, I don't think I quite fitted in with the, the uh, sort of semi-rural scene that they had um, um, embedded that in. What was wonderful about that series is that we were on location uh, based at the Frankton Arm Hotel and we were um, bussed up the Moak Valley every morning, um, a good uh, 12 or 13 miles really into the interior. Um, and um, we, we had all the wagons from various parts of uh, uh, the South Island, um, of which there seem to be an extraordinary number that people have saved and collected. Big old cob coaches um, and, and some wonderful, um, wonderful large horses. Uh, what are they called? Not, um, oh, those great big heavy clopping horses. Clydesdales, thank you. Yes, big Clydesdales. And I, I had a lovely old darling called Molly G, who I became very fond of. Um, and had I been able to, I might have done what a friend of mine did in another series um, w where he actually ended up using his fee to purchase his horse at the end of it. <laughs> but no, it was a wonderful series and it, uh, it, it's, it's enjoyed continuing success. And because it's a costume thing, it is timeless and I believe is still getting an airing uh, overseas. A friend of mine actually saw it in Mongolia some years ago when he was there helping them with their tax system and in his hotel one night he saw Hunter's Gold all um, translated into Mongolian, which has been rather fun. I think the boss actually personified every headmaster I'd ever operated under who was sitting on a superannuation job and didn't, didn't, didn't want anything disturbed stuck very much to the letter of having the T's crossed and, and the I's dotted and where the red ink needed to be used, you didn't dare put blue ink. And I'd had so many headmasters like that and I thought, they're not really interested in what's going on at the cliff face with the fact that you're teaching kids. No, their interest was to teach subjects. And I think that the boss in Gliding On epitomised the public service and, and everything that represented in terms of how many pencils you were allocated during the week. I think probably the freedom that we had to actually uh, use Roger's basic script as a guideline, and then we, we kicked it around for two or three days before we actually did the, the, the two days of filming. And, and each week was like, like that. I mean, they were all reasonably uh, bright, um, individuals who had uh, um, their own comedic elements to be able to introduce. So where there was an opportunity to um, slip in something which was quite off the cuff, but if it actually got the laugh of, of, the, uh, of the company at the time, then we, we would more, more or less try to include it. Because I was playing a GI pilot, they decided I should have a crew cut and, uh, and because of the age of the character being post-war, it should be grey. So I had this uh, crew cut done and the uh, attempt, my hair was a lot darker then, I have to say, but the, the attempt to make it grey-white was, um, was quite a task. It required me about three or four visits to the hairdresser and, uh, and they eventually um, managed to uh, achieve a reasonable sort of whiteness with it. The first day of shooting came, I had to be underwater. It immediately turned green, which was uh, a strange chemical reaction. 
Um, the reason for which I, st I still don't know, but it, it turned quite a, a greasy shade of green. Uh, so we had to uh, we had to abandon that day shooting until we could rectify the colour of the hair. But the joy of it was working with the three young Maori boys um, who were the sea urchins. Um, and uh, the, the middle-aged one is um, still working, I think, in radio or broadcaster, Robert Rackety. He's still working somewhere in radio, I think. Um, and the other two I haven't seen anything of. Uh, Jason Pirapi was the youngest one. The older one, I don't remember. Anyway, it was lovely working, working with these three young lads who uh, were incredibly professional, given their lack of experience, incredibly professional. And, uh, uh, and that was a tribute to Wayne Terrell's ability as a, as a director and uh, mentor and governor and teacher as he was um, with those kids. I had great respect for him. The character of Sir Bruce Warner um, really appeared and I, no more than about half a dozen episodes, I suppose, in one year and then about another three episodes the following year uh, in which he um, meets his ultimate demise through cancer. I found with Shortland Street that uh, the character of Sir Bruce Warner had been written in such a way that he was uh, terribly abrasive and as a result vastly unpopular. Well, that's okay. I don't mind as a character being, being unpopular, but I kept having to say, look, I, I don't believe in what you've written here that I can say that to a nurse without getting a smack across the face. I mean, I just would not do that. I, it's just so impolite. And I, I kept having this issue with the writers, uh, I think, over uh, the way that they, um, they saw Sir Bruce being uh, just, I, I felt, too, uh, too abrasive and, uh, and abusive on occasions. Uh, so I was constantly battling with that. But however, it was, um, it was a good job while it lasted. I considered myself to be extremely fortunate that I escaped what could have been uh, a very tragic moment because I flew in on the helicopter and because the helicopter was not allowed to land, it hovered a metre above the pad. I was to then climb out um, on the skid and then jump down onto the helicopter pad. As I did, the belt of my raincoat whipped around the skid. Fortunately, because my normal procedure would have been to have a belt buckle on a coat on the left side so that I buckled from the right. The, the belt on this raincoat had the buckle on the right. So when it whipped around, it caught on the, on the skid, but fortunately and successfully pulled the belt out, which it wouldn't have done had the buckle been on the other end. So the helicopter took off at a 40 degree angle and, uh, and my belt with it. Uh, so I, there was a great sigh of relief from everybody in the crew and uh, not the least from myself <laughs> that I survived that uh, rather horrific moment. The lovely uh, experience about that, of course, was working with a lot of your mates and this was sort of coming back together like a reunion with a lot of these people that I've worked with over, uh, over the last 50 years. And, uh, and Nothing had changed somehow, except obviously our, our appearance and perhaps our height. <laughs> but uh, that was a great joy to, to work with them and with Tony Barry, who I've worked with before. Uh, lovely actor. Um, um, what, what was so enjoyable about that was the opportunity for us to, to show that even though we had all past the age of 50, we still had some capability in the craft because there's not a lot of people now that look to use you when you pass that age, um, which, is, which is a very sad indictment because all that experience is um, sort of lying fallow. Um, and I'm, I'm hoping that it's high time someone will recognise that and get cracking again with the more experienced older actors.